Let us pray. God of justice and peace, we gather at this solemn time of year, aware of the costliness of human history. In the face of hostility between nations and neighbors, you have come to us in Jesus Christ, carrying no sword, calling us to serve as peacemakers. In this time of worship, renew in us the hope that you will turn swords into plowshares and lead the world you love away from the study of war to the promise of peace with justice for all your peoples. God of justice and mercy, we confess that the world around us is in a mess. Countries turn disputes over territory into threats of terror. Old enemies stir up conflict within their tribes and nations. Threats of violence keep us all on edge. We confess we have not learned from past conflicts, which leads to peace with justice among nations and neighbors. Forgive us and lead us in a better way. In your Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not that this world gives, do I give to you. Through God's mercy, our sin is forgiven. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 64, Be Still and Know That I Am God. and 
welcome again. This morning I want to do uh, something that is called an object lesson. And that's a lesson that you learn uh, that doesn't have a lot of talking or explaining or history. It just has you watching, listening, engaging your senses, and learning something from what you see rather than what you hear. So I've called this object lesson, What Jesus Noticed. Let us pray. Gracious God, you sent into our midst, our midst your son, Jesus. And Jesus came and taught and healed and fed. He was part of a community. And Jesus observed. He looked, he listened, he heard. He reached out and touched. Thank you, Lord, for being with us, for observing, for noticing each single one of us, whoever we are, whatever circumstance we're in. We do not need to yell for your attention. We've always had your attention. And because we have your attention, you sent us your son to live to die and to rise again for us, whoever we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of First Kings. This is a book about kings, or so it starts. And the king currently on the throne is King Ahab. We're reading 1 Kings chapter 17, and we're starting at the very first verse. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Some time later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, 
Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is not found in your hymn book, but I think you know it. You all know it. It is Let There Be Peace on Earth. names, but no names, 
just as they are in the scriptures. Now, King Ahab has taken his place in a long list of kings. Kings of Judah and kings of Israel. The king's names, as well as their achievements and their legacies, have been recorded in stone script and on papyrus books. Centuries later, guys like this would get their portraits painted and hung in the grand halls of some behemoth castles. <clears throat> the Bible also lists them by name. Rehoboam, king of Judah, Abijah, king of Judah, Azah, Nadab, both kings of Judah, and then there was Basha, king of Israel, Elah, Zimri, and Omri, all kings of Israel. And King Omri, it is written in the Bible, about him it was written, but Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. Omri was Ahab's father. Ahab was riding an incredible wave of privilege. Whole cities were being rebuilt with temples and ornate gates, ten-foot-high marble statues and modern infrastructure in roadways and fortifications, all going in and rising up on the backs of no names. Then Ahab really clinched his position as a powerhouse in history by marrying Queen Jezebel, therefore successfully uniting two kingdoms. And just so that his new bride would feel completely and absolutely comfortable and welcome in Israel, King Ahab set up her god, that would be Baal, god of rain, god of fertility, god of life, throughout the land. Anybody got a problem with that? Well, you better not say anything because you won't last long. Oh, but please do not despair because this is a story about the interruption of the royal narrative. Quite shockingly, Elijah strides between those soaring pillars and presents himself in the grand hall before the royal throne, standing on the shiny marble floors, polished by no names. And he says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain for the next few years except at my word. You know, a person could get killed on the spot for showing up in front of the king without an invitation. Walter Brueggemann wrote that the Bible lives in a world of water scarcity. And you know, it's really quite hard for us today to imagine a world devastated by drought, especially when we live a few blocks away from a massive waterfall with shut, which shunts tons of water over it, its edge 24-7. If we had a drought, the rock edge of the falls would be exposed. The canals would be dried up. The Niagara River, a mere trickle. Our ponds and our pools would blister and peel in the midday sun. Our faucets, whether they are old-fashioned or tap technology, would yield not a drop. How long would it take before real panic set in? Forget about hoarding toilet paper. What if it was water at stake? In those days, the king was believed to be responsible for the rain. Just like today, our elected politicians are considered to be responsible for the economy. And of course, among all the other gods, statues, and temples, and altars crowding out their view, King Ahab had just called for a full embrace of Jezebel's god, named Baal, god of rain, god of fertility, God of life. Because we today 
are sort of unfamiliar with droughts and kings. We may not realize what a huge threat a drought was to the relevance of a king. What was he good for if he couldn't keep the people alive and functioning? A king in a time of drought becomes impotent and redundant, reduced to the value of a no name, no matter how many times he tells you something different. People would be saying, it's time to be getting a new king. God, through Elijah, said something very, very different. Elijah is told by God to remove himself from this society of lavish, self-serving indulgence. He's told to stop eating their junk food and instead to go to Sidon in the east, which is Jezebel's home territory, by the way. Quite dangerous. He's instructed to drink from a brook and eat only what ravens bring him. Isn't it interesting that Elijah is fed not by one of God's spectacular birds, like an eagle or a falcon or even a trumpet or swan, but by such common, nondescript birds like ravens. A famine affects everyone. Sometime later, the, book, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah again. Go at once to Zarephath and stay there. A famine affects everyone, just like a pandemic. But it doesn't affect everyone equally. We are not really in the same boat at all. God sent that bold, brave prophet who marched before the king unannounced and declared that he served the Lord, the God of Israel. He sent that man to be fed deep now into a famine by a widow with a son. If ravens are one of the least spectacular birds in Oban's field guide, then a no-name widow during a famine has got to be the least of the least able to provide food for anyone. We need to ask ourselves, which was actually more daunting for Elijah? Standing on that marble floor waiting for the sword to come down? Or lying on the widow's dirt floor waiting to succumb to starvation? Some of the hardest words we can hear are, there's nothing more we can do. When a forest fire is raging out of control and there aren't enough bush planks to carry water into a remote, tinder dry location and the fire marshal says, there's nothing more we can do but pray for rain. When the medics pull back from a person we love and say, there's nothing more we can do. Pray for a miracle. Hopelessness is banging at the door of our hearts. Hopelessness is one of the best tools the devil has in his toolbox. And on the threshold of hopelessness is the place we meet the unnamed widow, gathering sticks to prepare the last supper for herself and her child. This is what the king has done. This is what the height of power and privilege has brought to bear on God's beloved. This story is a cautionary tale for all who hear it. And after meeting the widow, just as God said he would, and hearing her story, Elijah says to her, Don't be afraid. 
But by all human standards, there seems to be nothing left but to be afraid. She has no more resources at her disposal. And she actually accepts her fate. That this is the way the world works. And the Bible says, no. And Elijah declares it by saying, no, not like this. This is not the way God designed the world to work. Elijah, the man speaking on behalf of the living God, says, do not be afraid. Elijah refuses to accept what the world says. This is not the inevitable fallout, the nature of things, or the fate of humanity. God, through Elijah, interrupts the royal narrative, the myth of privilege, power, and perpetuity for some, and scarcity and death for others. The widow, the foreigner, the no-name, trusted Elijah's God. She shared her bread and water, and her flour was not used up, and her jug of oil did not run dry. We are not told all the details here, because the details do not matter. God gives abundant gifts that will not run out and will not dry up for eternity. If that doesn't amaze us, I don't know what will. Martin Buber wrote that a miracle is a happening of abiding astonishment. When we go home today, think about this, his, this story, this history, and let that astonishment wash over you again and again. The flower did not run out. Death did not win. Despair was transformed to hope. God's work in this world was through those on the stage and those behind the scenes. The kings said, we have the power and the privilege. And God said, I will come among you as one with no name. The king said, we have sumptuous banquets served to us. And Jesus tied a towel around his waist and served the last supper, which will go on for eternity. The kings said, we will live in perpetuity, in tombs and stone script and papyrus paper. And Jesus said, there are many dwelling places in my father's house. If it were not so, I should not have told you, for I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I shall come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. Set your troubled hearts at rest and banish your fears. Amen. Peace. God of all the ages past, 
hope of years to come. We gather in this season of remembrance, grateful that you hold each one of us in your memory and your mystery now and for all the time to come. Today we remember all those who have served to uphold justice and freedom in the wars of the last century, in conflicts of our own generation, and in peacekeeping and relief efforts around the world. Especially we pray for those who have died in this service and for those who carry scars on body and soul having returned from conflict. We remember their courage and we pray for their families who still ache for life surrendered at a great cost. Oh God, we remember before you the victims of conflict hiding in forgotten corners of the world, longing for safety and peace. Especially we pray for people in Afghanistan who fear for their lives and their futures. We remember victims of violence in our own country, still fearful, fearful and uncertain about what the future holds for them. Give us the courage to speak out for their protection and recovery. Oh God, we remember those around us who struggle to remember day by day. Those who must cope with the fear of forgetting. Those who matter most to them and those who face the fear of being forgotten. Help us remember to reach out in comfort and support so that no one is forgotten. Oh God, we remember those around us who carry on under the burden of sad and hard memories, those weighted down by grief, disappointment, anger, pain, and loss. Inspire us to offer a listening ear and an understanding heart whenever we can. God of all the ages past, hope of years to come, help us to remember you day by day. Keep us prepared to shine the light of your gospel into the dark corners of the world so that hope is renewed in the hearts of many. We pray now for those who are personal to us. to leave this service walk with us and show us how to live each day as those who follow Jesus. For we dare to pray the words he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, Jackie will play the Lord bless you. Thank you. 